Hare Krishna. On the sacred occasion of the 100th anniversary of the disappearance of Bhaktuna Thakur, let us understand his contributions uh, through see the series of talks. So, in the first two parts, we discussed about his harmonization of reason and faith, and then his harmonization of uh, the various religions through understanding the unity of their purpose. Now, we will continue discussion of his uh, harmonization of different forms of worship through the concept of Saragrahi and Bharagrahi and the concept of Panchopasana. So, in this world we see there are so many conflicts among different religions and uh, there are so many differences which often become the cause of these conflicts. So, Bhaktivinoda Thakur in the Krishna Samhita explains first of all that there are two kinds of religious worshippers. There are Bharavahi and Saragrahi. Bharavahi are those who are burden bearers and Saragrahi are essence acceptors. So, those who focus on externals often end up with conflicts. So, for example, the principle of offering respect to God is common in all the great religions of the world. Now, that respect may be offered in different ways. The Muslims may offer namaz, the Christians may offer mass, the Hindus may fold hands and offer namaskar. Now, if we just focus on the externals, we will say that, oh, you are doing something different, I am doing something different, that person is doing something different and therefore, we are different and we may fight. But if we go beyond the externals to the essence, saragrahi, just like um, swan uh, puts aside the water and goes to the milk. So, like that if we go, then we will be able to see beyond the differences to the essence and then we will see the essential uh, uh, unifying thread uh, in the various faith expressions of the world. So, of course, Bhaktivinoda Thakur does not reject the external rituals or the, uh, or the institutional dogmas, because he says by following this also, one will gradually become elevated and the Bharavahi can become Saragrahi. But if one is intelligent enough, deep enough, then one can uh, avoid the state of conflict which is caused uh, at the Bharavahi stage and directly focus on the Saragrahi. And then, how can the Saragrahi see the underlying thread of unity in the various uh, religious forms of the world? So, he takes the he gives an explanation of Panchopasana uh, in a progressive way. Now, Panchopasana, Upasana is worship, Pancha is fire. So, Panchopasana uh, emerged in the Indian history, uh, especially in the post Buddhist times. It was developed by the Smartas for the purpose of uniting India. So, Pancha Upasana, the five deities are worshipped, that is Vishnu, Shiva, Shakti, Surya and Ganesh. And the various different kinds of people who were worshipping different things, when Shankaracharya brought them together after uh, driving Buddhism out of India, then he brought them all together under uh, the Vedic umbrella. And these five forms of worship were going on. Now, often this uh, uh, Panchopasana is not a simplistic demigod worship. Uh, actually, it is often a form of not polytheism, but what is called as Cathenotheism. A uh, Cathenotheism means, it is called Henotheism in short, Cathenotheism is more specific. Henotheism means there is one absolute truth who manifests in many different forms. That is called henotheism. So, that means the idea is 
uh, you can one can choose whichever form one wants to worship and one can worship that form but ultimately one will go to that same absolute truth so uh, the idea was that so ultimately it's a form of impersonalism panchopasana but bhaktivinoda thakur based on his great realizations and his understanding of the essential singular import of the vedic scriptures the bhagavad gita says vedaischa sarvair ahameva vedyo in 15.15 so based on that he explains how these five forms of worship are, are not five separate paths they are not like five ways of climbing up to the peak of a mountain which is what was uh, often conventionally thought but he said they are like five rungs on a ladder which will take us to the peak of the mountain so they are not uh, they don't refer to five distinct deities although that is also the way people worship but they are five levels of comprehending the divine so this begins with shaktism so shaktism is not just the worship of uh, the goddess shakti durga parvati but what does that actually represent when a person is in an existential quest trying to understand the absolute truth at that time one begins by focusing on uh, the world around one self and one says okay there is nature and it is uh, in nature that i am living it is through the grace of nature that i am living and the natural resources are what are essential for my life so therefore one starts worshiping nature itself and uh, so various forms of animism animism means those which ascribe uh, ascribe a life of to nature itself and then worship nature as supreme uh, they were the present long time ago in europe then often they are associated with some uh, forms of african religions Uh, and it's of course very common in china and japan it was historically much more common also so this is to worship nature as if it is god this is shaktism now if one keeps worshiping like this gradually one understands yes nature is sustaining me but nature is deriving energy from somewhere and where is that nature uh, the nature deriving that energy from that is actually from the Uh, sun which is the reservoir of all energy so therefore it is the sun which is giving energy to all of us and it is the sun that is the object of worship so at this level the shaktas become the sauryas sauryas means the worshipers of the sun god so now of course in the vedic tradition there are the brahmanas who chant the gayatri mantra now chanting of the gayatri mantra can be a form of uh, vaishnava bhakti if one understand that the object whom one is worshiping is surya narayan is lord narayan who is present as the lord of surya in his heart and in his abode but if one considers the sun as the independent supreme then one is at the level of shaurya worship saurya worship so is brahmana who chant gayatri thinking of the sun as the source of all illumination and existence Uh, they are sauryas and similarly if we see the primary egyptian deity in ancient times was ra that's actually uh, a worship form of worship of the sun and the bible also tells us that the residents of uh, canaan who used to worship baal they baal that was also a form of solar worship so the worship of sun has been quite common in ancient religions because people did understand that the sun is the source of energy now after this uh, gradually one's consciousness as it evolves one starts thinking of that yes there is nature there is energy but energy stems from consciousness and therefore the consciousness is manifested in forms so one rises from matter, matter and energy to conscious beings at this level one worships uh, the consciousness that is manifested through uh, subhuman beings or animals so this is the level of ganapati worship now at the level of ganapati worship one focuses on worshiping the 
worshipping the absolute in the form of animals like cats and horses. And today people keep some cats as pets, but in ancient Egypt, uh, in, some, uh, in, uh, in some phase in Egypt, cats were kept not as family pets, but as family deities. And there are some forms of totem worship, which also were there in the Americas, among Native Americans. They also involved some sort of worship of animals. So this is the Ganapatya level of worship. Uh, as one moves forward from here, then one comes to recognize that the higher in the consciousness in animals is the consciousness in humans. So uh, there one starts uh, worshipping a particular person whom one sees as perfect. And uh, this sort of worship that focuses on a person uh, is, Bhakti Thakur explains the Shaivism. Now of course, Shiva is a person who is who is an extraordinary person, a powerful deity, no doubt. And like that it applies for the previous deities also. But here Bhaktivinoda Thakur is explaining the consciousness of people who are at this level of worship. So this is the level of worship where we, there are spiritual personality cults that often happen. And where one focuses on perfecting one's own human consciousness by taking the model of some human being that one imagines to be perfect. And interestingly, Bhaktivinoda Thakur classifies Jainism and Buddhism as forms of Shaivism. So why? Because in these religions, there is an uh, enlightened being, a uh, Tirthankara, a Mahavira, a Buddha, a Lama. And that enlightened being becomes the, uh, the focus of worship. Although these religions are themselves are non-theistic, but they focus on, pursue, uh, on perfecting the human consciousness. And that way, they move forward. Uh, and that way, they also help the person to evolve. Now, as one moves forward, forward one then recognizes that actually beyond the worship of such uh, human beings, who may be very elevated, there is the worship of the Supreme Being, who alone is complete and perfect. And at this level of worship, when one worships God as the Supreme Person, that is Vaishnavism. So now, uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur classifies Christianity and Islam also as forms of Vaishnavism. Why? Because they have a conception of God as a person. Of course, Islam has the conception of God as personal but formless. So, in that sense, it is between personalism and impersonalism. Because the impersonalists consider God to be uh, imper having no personality and having no form. The personalists understand that God has personality and form. Islam conceives of God as a person but without form. But anyway, Bhakti Vinod Thakur explains that because they have a personal conception of uh, the absolute truth, so they are also... Vaishnavism. Uh, they, they are also uh, included with Vaishnavism. And of course, within the Vedic tradition, there are those who worship, there are Vaishnavas who worship Vishnu. Now, interestingly, Bhaktivinoda Thakur again classifies Vaishnavism in two ways. This is analogous to his initial classification of religions as Sa uh, Bharavahi and Saragrahi. He says that Vaishnavism can be uh, Sampradayik and Satvata. Sampradayik the word sampradaya, we often use it to refer to a, a religious tradition in which we get spiritual knowledge. But essentially, the sampradaya means a group or a party. So he says the sampradayic Vaishnavism is sectarian Vaishnavism. And sattvata Vaishnavism is non-sectarian universal Vaishnavism. That means that in sectarian Vaishnavism, in sampradayic Vaishnavism, one imagines that one's, mm, one's religion, one, uh, one's Vaishnavism is the only way. So just as we have G uh, Christians who claim that Jesus says that uh, I am the way and none shall go to the Father except through me. And so people take this to uh, 
uh, not only uh, assume that they alone will go back to God, but they also assume that everyone else has to follow their way to go back to God. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains elsewhere that Saragrahi Vaishnavas or Satvata Vaishnavas understand such statements as intended to create a focus on, on, on one's path. They are not uh, meant to be exclusivist in the sense of rejecting all other paths, but they are uh, meant to be uh, creating a focus so that one doesn't get distracted. Just like a uh, doctor may accept that there are, doctor accepts that there are other doctors who can also give valid prescriptions by which a patient can be cured. But once a patient comes to a doctor, the doctor says, forget all other treatment that you have heard, just take this now and you will get cured. So these statements are like that. Now Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains that uh, the, the, those, those who worship a personal God, but if they consider their way to be the only way, then they are, uh, they are Vaishnavas, but they are Sampradayika Vaishnavas. And then Satvata Vaishnavas are those who are uh, focused purely on transcendence and they focus on the essence and they, by practicing that essence they attain the perfection of life. So herein he describes that the Bhagavatam actually talks of Satvata, uh, Satvata Vaishnavism and that's why the Bhagavatam does not even use any name for it. Okay, so it's, it's beyond any nomenclature like Christianity, Islam, Hinduism. The Bhagavatam in 1.2.6 says how is the soul get satisfied by performing pure, unmotivated, uninterrupted devotional service to the Supreme Lord? And in this way, one attains the supreme perfection of life. So, in this way, by moving from the worship of First, moving from externals to its sense, from Bharavahi to Saragrahi, and in the essence, recognizing the progression from worship of nature to worship of energy to worship of consciousness manifested as animal form, or consciousness manifested as humans, and then consciousness manifested as a supreme person, and then recognizing that that supreme person is not just uh, uh, my monopoly. Bhaktivinoda Thakur says also that that the truth and God, who is the giver of the truth, are not the monopoly of any religion. No, religion is meant for God. God is not meant for religion. God is far greater than any of the great religions that we offer to him in his service. And that's why um, he says that there is, there can be worship of personal God, but it can be sampradayik, but beyond that is satvata. And it is this that Bhagavatam offers endorses, glorifies and it is that which uh, he has explained and revealed to us. That is what we have got through the Gaudi Vaishnava tradition. By following that, we can develop pure love for God and attain life's supreme perfection. Thank you. Hare Krishna.